With his confession of murdering 166 girls, of which eight cases have been confirmed, he acted with brutal and cruel tricks. He is a Canadian-American serial killer. The police force has I had to use all my strength to track them down, but I was still powerless against the cunning and cunning because it was too boring and to challenge the murderer who repeatedly sent letters to the government and the police inside each letter. Letters and crime scenes contain images of a smiling cartoon frame, that's why. The nickname, Smiley Face Killer, was given to the perpetrator of the horrifying massacres that shocked America in the 1990s. Hello everyone, today Vac will learn with you about Keith Hunter, the Smiley Face Killer. Intense Childhood Keith Hunter Jesperson, born April 6, 1955 in Canada, in a family of five siblings, Jesperson's father was an alcoholic with a patriarchal, domineering personality. Keith's grandfather was also a man with violent tendencies. From an early age, Keith was shunned by his friends and given unkind nicknames because of his large body. Keith spent part of his childhood in Canada before his family moved to Washington, USA. Something he didn't want at all. He had difficulty fitting in and making friends because of his large body. His brothers did not help him, so Keith was even isolated within his own family by his brothers. The alcoholic father only cares about Keith when he makes a mistake. The father's curses and cruel beatings, with a belt in front of others, even when Keith had just been electrocuted to the point of death. Keith's school life in Washington was no brighter, he was bullied, ostracized and ostracized. In such circumstances, Keith could only vent his pent-up resentment on weaker creatures and destructive actions, setting fires, to relieve his anger. From a very young age, just five years old, Keith captured and tortured animals. He enjoys watching animals kill each other and taking their own lives. Keith often captured wild birds, cats, and dogs around the trailer park where he lived with his family brutally beating the animals and then strangling them to death, which shocked the young boy back then. Extremely excited. In the years that followed, Keith said he often thought and was curious about what it would be like to do the same thing with humans. It is known that killing animals and arson are two of the three characteristics of the McDonald Triad, a group of behaviors believed to predict the violent crimes of serial killers. When he was eight, Keith once brutally beat a younger best friend, because this friend often blamed Keith. His father promptly intervened, after which Keith admitted that he wanted to kill that friend. Keith also tried to drown another boy in the swimming pool, because that boy had drowned Keith before, luckily the lifeguard intervened. This is reminiscent of another brutal serial killer, Peter Curtin, who drowned two boys at the same time, when he was just nine years old. The world is broken after divorce. After graduating from high school, Keith got a steady job with a truck company in 1974. During this time, Keith met the woman of his life, Rose Huck. Keith used to be unlucky with girls in general, but as fate would have it, he won Rose's heart to start a new life. They married in 1975 and have three children together. But Keith's happy family collapsed in 1989, when Rose left him. Also during this time, Keith's dream of becoming a Royal Canadian Mounted Police Officer was shattered when he was seriously injured during training. Rose and Keith officially divorced in 1990. This was the turning point that led to a complete change in Keith's world. He returned to his job as a long-distance truck driver and his serial crimes officially began. First Murder and Unusual Story Keith's first murder took place in January 1990, the victim was a woman named Bennett. Keith meets Bennett at a bar. He took her to a room he rented nearby, had sex before beating and strangling Bennett to death. Strangulation to death, is exactly what Keith used to do to animals when he was a boy. And now he does it to humans. Keith dumped Bennett's body in a remote area of Oregon near the edge of the Columbia River, which borders Washington state. But Keith's first murder is tied to another extremely unusual story. In an apartment close to the area where police found the girl's body, there was a couple, Laverne Pavlinak and John Sosnowski. Three days after the Bennett murder was broadcast in the media, Ms. Pavlinak went to the police station. 
The police admitted all the blame for the incident. According to Pavlinak's testimony, she and her husband Tosnovske raped and killed Bennett together. The police and the court believed what she said. Pavlinak received 10 years in prison, while Sosnovsky was sentenced to life in prison. Pavlinak later admitted that she made up the story about Bennett's rape and murder, with the main purpose being to escape her relationship with Sosnovsky, her abusive husband. But that was what happened later, when a series of Keith's crimes were exposed to the light of justice. And at the time Pavlinak and Sosnovsky were arrested for Bennett's murder, Keith, the real author of the murder, was angry. Having his work robbed by someone else, Keith decided to leave a confession on a wall at the gas station where his truck passed. He even signed his name and drew a smiley face on the wall. But it was in vain, no one bothered to pay attention to Keith's message. Not giving up, Keith decided to send a six-page confession, of course anonymously, to the Oregonian, the most famous and oldest daily newspaper in the United States, in which he revealed details about his murder. Jesperson signed each letter with a smiling face. This led Phil Stanford, the journalist who wrote the story for the Oregonian, to dub Jesperson the happy face killer. Next victims. After murdering Bennett, Jesperson traveled in a long-distance truck looking for new targets. Most of his victims were prostitutes he met on the street, or at places where he stopped. During later interrogations, Keith claimed he had killed no less than 160 women. However, in total, only eight victims' bodies were found scattered from Florida to California, Oregon, Washington, including Bennett's case, which was determined to have been committed by Keith. There was also one case where Keith actually spared his victim's life. In April 1990, Keith met a woman in a California parking lot, drunk. The woman, carrying a several-month-old baby, introduced herself as Jean. The two talked, and they decided to go to a nearby hotel together. As usual, after having sex, Keith began beating the woman for several hours. But this time he did not kill Jean, the main reason was because she had a small child by her side. Keith took Jean and her mother back to a location near the California parking lot and dropped them off there. This is also Keith's only surviving victim, according to subsequent investigation results, whose real name is Don Slagle. Angela Surprise, one of Keith's last two victims, was also someone he had known before. In 1995, Angela hitchhiked in Keith's truck, from Washington State to Indiana. A familiar scenario. Angela was raped, beaten and strangled to death. But what Keith did next was even more terrible. He tied Angela's body under the truck with a strong rope and dragged her body hundreds of kilometers down the road. Crime exposed. Keith could have prolonged his crime spree if he had only killed women he did not know. But Keith's impulsiveness and madness caused him to choose his own girlfriend as the target for murder. And it was this fact that caused him to fall into the law. Julie Ann Winningham was Keith's girlfriend at the time he killed her. There was too much evidence against Keith in Ann's murder and he was arrested by the police. In the detention camp, Keith tried to commit suicide twice but failed. In the end, he decided to plead guilty, not only to Ann's murder but to all previous serial murders. In total, Keith was sentenced to four life sentences for the terrible crimes he committed. And after all, what happened to John Sosnovsky, the victim of his wife Laverne Pavlinak's imaginary confession about Keith's first murder? In 1996, one year after Keith's crimes were exposed and six years in prison for a murder that had nothing to do with them, the two were released. In November 2008, Jesperson's daughter, Melissa G. Moore, is a reporter who often participates in popular shows, and once appeared on Dr. Phil to talk about her father. She published one of her articles titled Shattered Silence, the untold story of a serial killer's daughter. The article has the following content. Moore recounted living with Jesperson until her parents divorced in 1990, and noticing how different her father was when she was in elementary school. Their house bordered an apple orchard, and Jesperson killed stray cats and kangaroos that roamed nearby. One day, she watched in horror as he hung stray kittens from the family clothesline. She ran to find her mother and when they returned, the kittens lay dead on the ground. He watched and laughed as the kittens clawed at each other to escape, then he killed them. How do you feel about the above case? 
Is there anything that you find interesting? Please leave your comments below in the comment section as well as the cases that you are curious to explore. Remember to subscribe to the channel to watch the latest episodes of VAC. Hope you enjoy watching the video.